So our aim here is to try to understand style. We'll begin with our elements and principles to try to define and identify the characteristics that make each style unique and recognizable. And then we'll go on to explore why an artist might choose a particular style to depict a particular subject. Let's start with a little recap of our styles that were introduced in the readings. Okay, we divided your uh, artistic styles into three basic categories, abstraction, naturalism, and idealized. So there are many more styles that are considered artistic styles, but for this introductory class, we have just, um, we're just introducing the three uh, most common styles. Now, we also have historical styles. Historical styles are contingent on factors such as the particular time period, a geographic location, or even a specific art movement. In some cases, individual styles of particular artists reflect these criteria, but not always. Sometimes artists are working in their own style against the tide of the prevailing styles. Okay, of the historical styles introduced to you in the readings, you only, only had two to uh, think about, neoclassical style and realism. Okay, so let's go back up here and take a look at our artistic styles for just a minute. So all of our historical styles are rooted in an artistic style. If you think of this as a continuum, you basically have abstraction, naturalism right in the middle, and then you have an idealized style. And I'll explain why I'm explaining this in terms of a continuum. Okay, so let's just begin with abstraction. I'm sorry, naturalism right here in the middle. Naturalism is the way artists have chosen to depict what they see for centuries. Naturalism is the way we commonly think of Western image making. Naturalism is the attempt by an artist to use paint to replicate the illusion of three-dimensional space onto a flat surface. The artist does this by using a series of tricks. All of these tricks are rooted in mathematically correct linear perspective. And uh, the artist goes on to use light, shadow, and a system of blending brushworks to create continuous tones that create this illusion of volumes that occupy three-dimensional space. Now, um, assuming this naturalism is something closest to what we actually see, so something that's optically correct, when one begins sort of uh, taking the parts, taking the um, taking these parts, these parts apart and reassembling them in some sort of different and novel way, we might call that abstraction. So many of you are familiar with the work of Picasso. Think of how Picasso made his faces. He would kind of mix up the parts. There might be a frontal eye while there's a profile nose and so forth and unusual colors and things like that. So this departure from naturalism is one of the things that characterizes abstraction. When you can still recognize subject matter, we call that representational abstraction. Now when subject matter is completely obliterated and you can't recognize anything at all, where the canvas is basically just covered with marks and brush strokes, of, say a Jackson Pollock drip painting, that would be an example of non-objective abstraction, something that is completely detached from what we would see in the visible world. Okay, going back this other direction on our continuum, idealized style. Idealized styles always begin with naturalism. That is, they are rooted in what we actually see. However, these styles are polished, they're perfected, they're often applied to grandiose subject matter. So for a sort of everyday example, I like to use the example of photoshopped images of celebrities. So if any of you have ever seen a comparison between um, a, a celebrity all decked out, um, she's probably 20 pounds lighter, um, has completely flawless skin and big full hair. Compare that with the original photo and you'll see a very big difference in many cases. Okay, so let's get started here. I'm going to start with Death of Socrates. Okay, part of your task here was to connect the styles here with the style that you see in the readings. So um, Jacqueline, you have uh, identified a naturalistic style, which is uh, both of these are rooted in, in a naturalistic style. Bill, as well, you have noted a naturalistic style. Christopher and Geraldine. Okay, so most of you understand that this is rooted in naturalism. 
it's rooted in something close to what we actually see. Now I'd like you to look a little closer and let's try and look, look through these and see how they're actually very different. They part company pretty quickly. All right, let's just start with the, the Jacques-Louis David painting. First of all, let's begin with the subject matter. The subject matter is lofty and grand. It's, it's depicting the death of one of the great philosophers of the golden age of Athens, of course, Socrates. Socrates, uh, right here, this guy in the middle, he's been sentenced to death. He is to drink this poison right here, this hemlock. It's, uh, we see a room full of people in these very grand gestures, these sort of exaggerated poses of mourning. Look at this guy, his hand is buried in his elbow there. This one is looking downward. Uh, we have this one that's wailing with his arms up in the sky. It's positively operatic. It's, it's very contrived and it's very stage-like. If one were to uh, walk in on this scene in real life, one would see something um, far different. You wouldn't see all these perfectly coiffed hairstyles. You wouldn't see all of these uh, lovely intervals of different colors that alternate between warm and cool colors. You wouldn't see all these beautiful folds in the fabric that direct our eyes and create lots of texture and movement. You wouldn't see that at all. You'd see something nitty gritty. And of course you wouldn't see this, this stage-like lighting that um, somehow, miraculously, we've got light from the side, but somehow Socrates is also sort of illuminated from within. Okay, so we've established here that this, this painting is somewhat stage-like, somewhat contrived, and that is characteristic of the idealized style. So let's go back to our styles recap. And we have something right here. It's lofty, it's grandiose subject matter, it's polished and perfected. If you were to take a look uh, back at our, our people here, um, even the brushwork is very smooth, it's jewel-like. Uh, we don't see a stray brushwork at all. We don't see a stray line anywhere. If you were to see this in a museum, you'd see a perfectly polished, smooth surface. Um, the skin, the skin, for example, right here is just glowing with all of this, this seamless transition between warm and cool colors, uh, light and dark and highlights. Um, the musculature of Socrates here, um, other than his body looking a little bluish, this is not the physique of a of an old man. Um, in fact, Socrates was known to be a little heavier in physique, too. Um, so we have something that's very, very um, sort of perfected, very glossed over. Now let's compare that with our scene here. Now what's going on here? This is a casual scene. This is something anybody could happen upon in a cafe. The people aren't posed, um, or at least the artist is trying to give us the impression that the people aren't posed. Um, for example, we see the back of this one. If this were some formal portrait, she would almost be certainly looking out at us. This guy, he's more concerned with his newspaper. They're not looking at us at all. And look at this guy. Half his face has been cropped off. This is, this is a very informal posing of people. Uh, they're, they're, um, they're also doing informal things. They're not, um, they're not discussing philosophy. They're smoking a cigarette and um, eating bread and leaving crumbs all over the table. We have some half-drunk glasses of, uh, of booze that they're indulging in. We've got cigarette smoke everywhere. It's really kind of a nitty-gritty, um, not a very elegant scene. Um, to us, we might see the fancy clothes and think this is, um, they're all dressed up and elegant, but, but not really. This is just sort of the common, common attire of these Parisian nouveau riche from the time period. So, um, Let's take a look at our subject once again. What subject do we have here? Something lofty and grand. This, this philosopher is about to, he's been sentenced to death for corrupting the mind of the Athenian youth. And he's doing his last stand. He's sort of doing his soliloquy. He's making his final point. He's going to dramatically drink this poison here. It's all very, very lovely and noble. Um, whereas over here, um, everybody's just being casual. They're just sort of hanging out, being themselves. So. We can see how the subject matter is very different. Now we've already noted how this, the brushwork here is very polished, it's very smooth, there's not even a hair out of place. Now take a look at over here. If you've looked at this a little closely, you can see some of this brushwork describing this dress is rough. The artist has not blended every single stroke. The artist has, has left uh, many of these strokes visible. If you were to see this in a museum, you'd see these these sort of quick and thick strokes of gray here that are describing the underfolds of this fabric. So it doesn't have that polished and perfected look at all. 
Um, even in the background, the artist uses some quick highlights of white to describe this leather. If uh, Jacques-Louis Jacques -Louis, uh, David were doing it, he would have blended every single little stroke so it was invisible and smooth. But no, this, this artist um, from a time period um, known as realism, he's left all of this brush stroke visible. So that casualness in style coincides with the casualness in subject matter. So as we've noted, everyone is sort of uh, sort of hanging out and being casual. And the brushwork reflects that. This is not a highly polished style. This is um, something that we call painterly. The artist has left um, some of the brush strokes shell, which is very different from our death of Socrates. So the artist has adapted or adopted a particular style to uh, to honor a particular subject. So it's appropriate to use this highly formal, um, highly formal style to describe this lofty subject matter for the death of Socrates, while the artist here is using a more casual method of painting for a more casual subject matter. Okay, so as we have also talked about, styles are also contingent on historical time periods. So we can't attribute this um, entirely to um, simply honoring the style, but the, uh, these styles are also contingent on a particular time period. So these styles partially represent the tastes of the art market. So for example, here in the uh, late 1800s, I'm sorry, the late 1700s, during the neoclassical period, there was a taste for this sort of fancy mythological and lofty subject matter to decorate the estates of the aristocracy. But by, um, by the time we see the cafe scene in Paris, a hundred years later, the demographics of Paris had entirely changed. The population of Paris had doubled. There was a new class of nouveau riche, a bourgeois class that um, was not part of the old aristocracy, but that this was new money that uh, managed factories, worked in banks, um, ran businesses, and they had money to spend on works of art. And they, they, um, this particular group had a preference for things that were new and different that didn't reflect the old ways. And one of their preferences was a preference for uh, what we call realism. That is something that's very close to their everyday experience. These works were small. They were meant to hang in the maison instead of the chateau. And uh, they, were, uh, they were just very much closer to, uh, to something that, uh, a taste for the real, not something sort of lofty and silly and grand. Okay, so finally, um, I would like to mention that I think all of you have really, really done a nice job. You've gone uh, above and beyond expectations. We only asked you for a couple hundred words. Most of you have delivered more like uh, four or five hundred words, um, highly detailed, using your elements and principles. That's perfect, perfect. Keep doing that. Um, now, I would ask you to, um, in future assignments, not everyone here um, answered the question directly. The answer was... Um, the answer we were aiming for is what style is this? How can you look at these works of art, take a look at them closely, and connect them with styles that were introduced in your readings? So you had two styles introduced in your readings, and only two of the historical styles. So that was the neoclassical and the realism styles. So um, for those that were able to um, recognize how these works of art fit within these two, um, these two periods, that's, that's perfect. That's our aim here. Okay, if you've not already done so, please begin reading your textbook because those, uh, the lessons that are built into the classroom are a good, good place to start. They're a wonderful introduction, but they're not the last word. You really need a lot more information to fully understand works of art. So good job, everyone, and I uh, look forward to seeing what you come up with next. Can't, we, can't wait to read your Milestone 3 submission. So good job here. Thanks.